Hey everybody, welcome to a new edition of the MobileCast. We're coming to you live from sunny San Diego. Um, we're here for another conference, um, the M6 Mobility Exchange, and I have the distinct pleasure of sitting here with Brett Belding. He runs Mobility at Cisco, and I'm actually going to ask Brett to introduce himself. So hi everybody, I'm Brett Belding. Uh, I'm a senior manager within Cisco IT, um, and among other things, our team is responsible for our entire mobility service and our uh, BYOD strategy. So what we're going to talk with, you know, Brett is a master of all trades. And so what we're going to kind of talk about is a little bit of what Cisco's doing, what they've done, and, you know, some of the lessons that Brett's learned, A, through Cisco, but through, you know, the industry contacts and the other enterprises. So, you know, both Brett and I work in the enterprise, and it's actually a very interesting story. And we actually have, we trade war stories all the time, which is kind of where this podcast came about. So... Brett, let, let's start by just talking a little bit about the landscape of um, Cisco and where you came from. I know that you know the other day you and I were talking, and you know Cisco started out based you know 2002. You built your own kind of you know let's give people a device, let's put all this stuff together, and then let's start there and then talk about how you got to today where you guys are mostly a BYOD shop. Sure. So, so in um, in the 2002 2003 time frame, we decided that we wanted to enable our workforce. And, and we wanted to embrace mobility. And we took a look at the market. And the, one of the first decisions we made was that we don't want you to have to carry two devices. So we were looking at BlackBerry and we were looking at a few others. And at the time, if you remember that far back, you couldn't make a phone call with a BlackBerry. It was a pager with a keyboard. So then we looked at Palm and we, we ended up rolling out the Palm Trio 650 and on top of it, we put Credent to encrypt it, and we put Good as the email client, and we put Afaria as the device management tool. And, and then we wrote a couple, a few um, mobile apps and mobile websites to go on top of the platform. And, um, and so we essentially built a tiny laptop, right? Because that's what we knew how to do. And, and that's kind of where I was going to go. You, 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 know, we, you and I talk about legacy thinking all the time, and you know, IT loves to control everything so back then it was you have to encrypt the laptop you can you know bitlocker um there are a bunch of other products that do it and you actually have to own everything because that made everything on it safe and it sounds like that's exactly what you did you just built this solution that was you you say it yourself a tiny laptop yeah we did and 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 part of the reason we did it was because we we wanted to control the user experience and we wanted to control security and you know the industry was pretty nascent at the time and and so, and we didn't we didn't know how to do it any differently. We knew how to do it that way, and we took that approach, and then we added that on top of Nokia devices as well, on top of Symbian, uh, because we have a large workforce in Europe, and they primarily in that area, that region they really wanted uh, Symbian devices, and and that's how we kind of got our start. And then we added a couple of other Windows mobile devices from Samsung and Motorola, um, and we scaled all of that out to about twenty thousand users. And then this guy named Steve Jobs gets on stage. Infamous 2007 speech. In 2007 in January. And he says that he's going to turn his music player into a telephone, among other things. And it was a pretty terrible telephone at the time. But it was a pretty amazing device. And it was one of, not the, but one of the first times that we had a lot of people inside the company saying... I don't want what you're giving me, IT. I want an iPhone. And all I need you to do is enable it. I need you to get my email on this device. And the first version of the iPhone, there was no active sync. There, was, there wasn't even 3G connectivity. I mean, it was, it was a very basic thing. There was no app store, right? The whole first year, there was no app store. Think about it. 900,000 apps today, no app store then. So the first year, we looked at it and went, this is awesome, but I don't know what to do with it. And then... The iPhone 3G came out. I, and iPhone OS 2 at the time came out. And Apple announced ActiveSync. And Apple announced Cisco VPN. And Apple announced 3G connectivity. And, and the start the app start of the App Store and all these pieces. And let's refresh. Your guys are sitting here with this mini laptop that, you know, not easy to use. They were used to it. But essentially, you train them how to use, you know, this is how you VPN, this is how you dial in. But probably the only thing that came easy was the email because you had good or you were using a BlackBerry. You kind of, that was probably the only easy thing on the device at all. Well, so what was interesting was 
was around the same time, or shortly thereafter, let's say. So in 2008, three big things happened. So number one was the demand around the iPhone. And related to that was also demand around BlackBerry because at that point, we hadn't rolled out BlackBerry either. So we had big demand for the Bold 9000 because that came out about the same time and we had big demand for the iPhone. Yeah, if, and you, if you had said it was like the the touch the touch version, you, you remember the first <laughs> the touch storm touch? thing? Good oh Lord, my no. goodness! No, 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 no. Um, yeah, that we, was. We, a, Brett and I can tell war stories about the storm. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Verizon. That was that was pre Droid. Like yes. Droid was the reason why. And anyway, that was a great story. But um, so so that's what we had to solve, right? We had a, that was the first problem was we we need to offer choice that we weren't offering. So we wanted to figure out how we're going to offer choice. The second piece was we were in a recession and John Chambers went to the, went out in in the market in one of our earnings calls and said, we're going to cut expenses by a billion dollars a year, right? We're going to reset our expense curve. And then they turned around and came to me and our team and said, in order to do this, you need to cut your entire TCO by 30%. So you got to look at all the telecom spend, you got to look at all the IT spend, all the support spend, all the device spend, you got to look at the whole TCO and you got to take 30% out of it. And the third problem was at the time, Good was owned by Motorola. So they got bought by Motorola and they were owned by Motorola for this two year time period, which coincidentally was right when the iPhone came out. So we went to Good and we said, you're our incumbent vendor. When are you going to have an iPhone client? And they said, no, they just said no. And we said, okay, so so let's, you're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, you, you, know, you figured, hey, I can live with my old vendors. Let me go to them. It's the easiest way to do this. And they all kind of turned to you and said, um, no, really, uh, we can't help you out. That's right. So so we then took a big step back and we said, how are we really? How, what do we really want to do? And what we really wanted to do was go native. And we realized, like, when we took a step back, we realized in order to... to be clear, Brett's not saying go naked. He said native. Yes, native. Yes, native. Native. Um, so, so, so what that meant for us was we wanted to strip away all the complexity that we built on top of these devices. And instead of that, we wanted, to, we wanted the world's simplest setup experience. You should be able to take the phone out of the box, do as few things as po- possible to it, and get basic services like 3G connectivity, 4G connectivity now... Um, and get email calendar contacts, and eventually we added WebEx and Jabber and then a whole application store. So so essentially you figured out before it was even called UI and UX that you needed a good UI and UX, you know, that user experience was paramount. And, you know, it's amazing to watch people still struggle with that today. You know, I, I can't talk about, I can't, there are so many times I've seen people send out instructions on how to do something, and it's a 10-page document with 300 pictures, and you're just going, I can do this better. So what was, what was interesting related to that was that – so we announced this as a pilot, and, and, and we said it's community-supported is what we called it at the time. And we purpose built it for early adopters because we copied the Mac. So the, the side story around this is um, – at Cisco, in around the same time, we had thousands of Macs, but none of them were supported by IT. In fact, at one point, we were trying to use network admission control to block them from the network. But since then, we pivoted and we said, we want to enable the Macs. Well, in the interim, the Mac user population had created a wiki and a discussion forum, and they, they built self-support on their own. And so we sort of joined that community. We adopted and we said, let's, let's help out. We'll get these things leased. We'll try to make it a little easier to install stuff. We're going to try to add value to the community. And so we said, let's, for mobile, let's, let's copy this, right? Let's do the same thing for the iPhone. Well, what we didn't know then, but what we do know now, is that the adoption curve for a Mac looks, a, in terms of the types of people who choose it early, were completely different from early adopters of iPhones. Early adopters of Macs were all geeks. Everybody was a geek. They wanted to roll their own. They wanted to run multiple OSs. They wanted, they wanted to figure it all out themselves, which is great. We're a big tech company. There are a lot of people that want to do that. Perfect. I, I, I'm going to point out the comment you made the other day. You have all these people who – you're an IT company. Yep. And you have all these people who think they can roll their own IT. Yeah. And some of them actually can. They so. can. And, and they're quite good at it. And – 
And we originally ignored them and said, this is ridiculous. They're just trying to, you know, trying to annoy us. And what we realized was, no, we actually should listen. Like we have thousands of engineers at a big IT company. We need to embrace their knowledge and make them part. And we need to become part of their community and, and, and have a two way dialogue and have them help us make all this better. And so, but what we realized with the iPhone was that the iPhone, the adoption was totally different. So we had people all over the place, right? From super technical to super not technical who all wanted the very first versions of it. And so our community support approach, what we realized about a two years into it or a year and a half into it was it, was, it, it wasn't it was working because we had IT people designing, designing in quotes, websites. And they were fine for technical people because all they needed was server name, username, password, very simple stuff. But for the average person, it was a lot more difficult. We, we, we had to think about it differently. So we changed our support strategy. So we came up with a different way to do it. And we brought in visual designers and we moved it to our social platform. And we went from 800 pages down to 150 and made it nice and pretty and easy and automated a bunch more of the process along the way. Um, and, and that was, to me, that was a revelation because prior to that, I didn't realize that how important user experience was in lowering support costs. Because once we made self-support attractive and easy, then more and more people started to use it. And then our help desk cases went down. And so did the cost as a result. Our support costs started going down. You're one of the only companies I know that truly saves some money on BYOD. Because we hear a lot, you know, and you and I have actually talked about this, probably not recently, but, you know, um, and I'm going to call out VMware, for example. VMware came out and said, we saved $2 million by going to BYOD. And when you dug into the numbers, the reason they saved money was they had no mobile policy to begin with. And they were giving phones and devices out to everybody. And what they realized was, you know, we shouldn't be paying bills for everybody. Yep. There are people here that we shouldn't be doing it. So th what they really did was they saved $2 million because they put a mobile policy in place. Right. Which was due to the BYOD program, but BYOD didn't actually save them money. If they'd had the policy in place beforehand, they would have actually come out spending more money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. You know, our, the big thing, and you and I have talked about it, is BYOD isn't there to save money. BY, you know, instead of thinking of it as BYOD, bring your own device, it's a mobile program. It is. The fact that you have people who own their own device versus the COPE model, which is corporately owned, personally enabled, shouldn't make a difference. That's there's right. some ownership issues. You know, granted some privacy, some other issues, but in reality, those are just nuances to a mobile policy. Yep. And you know, because you actually have some cope devices, I, I you know, I know that we've talked about that as well. So yeah, for you know, testing like guys that write the WebEx app, for example, because what we what we learned on the legal side, both here in the U.S. and in several other countries as well, is that there are laws on the books that essentially state a company is required to provide the tools necessary to do the job. Well, if you're an iOS developer, the two tools you need are a Mac and an iOS device, or two if you're developing for both of them. So those are required. So we couldn't, we couldn't say to the developer, you gotta buy your own iPad, because that just doesn't make sense. But that's a very small percentage yep. of our workforce. So for our workforce in terms of productivity devices, it's all BYO. Uh, but for that small subset where they need it to literally to do their job, it's not a nice to have, it's a, it's a need to have. We still provide those. So and and to be small. clear, for your BYO um, program, you pay stipends for a fair amount of them, and then there's a set of them you don't, depending on, I think. We don't. So we don't do stipends. So we have either. Uh, service, either I'm sorry. I, stipend's the wrong word in yeah. your case. Either we pay the entire bill. So it's corporate paid service entirely. We own the number. We give you the number back. We don't really care about the number, but uh, we'll pay your bill. Um, primary reason we do that is uh, simplicity and spend leverage. So we don't want people to have to submit expense reports. We don't want to have to manage who got what stipend and when. Um, we get spend leverage with all of our carrier partners around the globe, many of whom are Cisco customers as well. Um, but that's why we do that, especially with international travel where you get some great economies of scale in that space. But that's only 30% of the device population. 70% of the device population is completely BYO, meaning you buy the device, you pay for the service. What we're giving you, you buy most of the apps, right? What we're giving you are IT services over the top. And, and it's an interesting split there. So you have 30% that you pay, you pay the whole nut. Yep. You pay everything. Except other, for the device. Except for the device. Yep. Then you have the other 70% where they pay for everything. That's right. 
Um, and the seventy percent is growing. And I, I'm going to guess that you know. So you provide services. Yep. Do you actually purchase apps? Do you provide any volume licensing or purchase any apps at all? We haven't yet um, because the model that we're going after with all of our software partners uh, is a cloud-based model, right? So we want to pay for the subscription in the cloud, and then we want the apps to be free because okay. we're, we're trying our very hardest to stick to that. There are exception cases, and if you really need to expense back an app, then you can do it. Um, we've tried to avoid volume licensing, not because we need to, but because we don't have a demand to yet. We don't. There isn't a big use case for it internally somebody today. Had, somebody hasn't come up with the app that costs money, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, it makes sense to roll it out to ten, twenty thousand people. That's right. When that happens, that's when you'll take a look. Yeah, at then it. we'll do it. Right? Then we'll need to do it. But but today, it's it it's either the case that we're building or buying. We're either building an app internally and deploying it or we're buying a cloud service that comes with the mobile apps. Um, And that's the model we prefer both internally and as a company, right? So if you want WebEx or you want Jabber, we don't charge you for the apps, right? We charge you for the service, um, which is obviously the predominant cloud model. Uh, And I hope it continues that way because it's easier to manage. And and what's interesting is, you know, you're one of the companies that gets it. You know, you're one of the people who, you know, you're a trailblazer and, you know, and leader in this, in, mo- in mobilizing enterprise. And, you know, what I find very cool, because we think very similarly about this, is we're both requirements-focused people. Yep. So we try, we try and meet the requirements and look at the user needs at versus, hmm, well, maybe they want this, maybe they don't. We're making choices for them, and we don't spend any time with the customer or the consumer. And we're not, I'm not even going to call them users, really, because your employees are your customers, too. Absolutely. And if you treat them like that, yep. you know, you get a certain respect, and, you know, that really helps. And one of the things that I've been talking about recently, I'm kind of curious how you guys handle it at Cisco, is giving your um, customers, your internal customers, your employees, the personal responsibility. I mean, I'm sure some of it comes from the fact that they're actually paying for the device themselves. So, you know, we know that they'll, they'll take care of it better. Yep. But, you know, with all these apps and everything else and the expensing and all that, you know, there's got to be some of it with your policy that you push a personal responsibility um, ethic on these guys. We do, and I think it's part of the Cisco culture. So, in general, we're a very trusting organization. We're a trust but verify company. Um, and that's – it's – it's part of our innovative culture in general, right? You kind of need to let people play with stuff and break it occasionally to, to find out something new. Um, and that's part of the way that we've always been. Um, and so so we're very much a trusting company. However, there are some things we don't compromise on, like security. I mean, we're not, you know, we, we don't, we don't have the security needs of a government military agency, for example, um, but we do have security needs. We want to protect our intellectual property from our competitors um, so that we can continue to have our market advantage. So uh, so we take a very balanced approach. Um, and on the ownership specifically, we saw a massive drop in the number of lost and stolen devices after we put the BYO mandate in place in 2009. And I'll actually give interesting information from our program. Um, we use a Coke program. You know, you get an iPad, you get an iPhone. Um, you can put your own, certainly your own apps or whatever on it, you know, within reason, as long as they don't interfere. You know, you can't use Dropbox to get our stuff and like that. At least that's what we should say mm-hmm. um, and try to um, enforce somewhat. But we've seen the same thing. Yep. You know, we're seeing that, you know, one program we deployed 900 iPads and they bought, you know, because we provided them, we bought 90 of them. We figured there'd be right. 10% breakage or, or lost or stolen. And what we found was four. Yeah. First year, four devices had to be replaced. Yep. And part, and now what's inter- now here's an interesting fact. Depending upon where you are in the world, that number changes. And I'm going to guess you see something similar. Um, we found, lo- and I won't say lost, I'm going to say more stolen. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly in um, Latin America, we found a few of those. We saw a lot of that um, overseas. Yes. And well, I mean, it depends on the country. But yeah. yeah. You can imagine the more risky the country gets, the higher that number gets. Um, but we're it, – it's, it's interesting. So we used to have hundreds of these, right? And four years ago, we had about 20,000 mobile devices. We now have 68,000. So we've tripped, roughly tripled in the last four years since we put this in place. 
Uh, so I get asked about BYO adoption. We don't have an adoption problem. In fact, I have the opposite problem, which is we add a thousand a month on average, if you do the math. So, um, yeah, a thousand a month on average. Uh, and we have 10 lost and stolen devices a month total globally. Um, and they tend to be lost, although there are some stolen, but it tends to be the, I left it in an airport or I left it in a taxi cab or it fell out of my pocket or, I uh, had one woman who left it on the roof of her car and drove away. Um, so it's on the side of some highway somewhere. Um, and naturally, as soon as she got home, she called panic because she didn't have her phone. And so thankfully, in that case, we pressed the remote white button, assuming it's still alive. And then we tell her to get a new one. Um, but there's 10 a month out of 67,000. So, but here's a question on that. So because I get asked this all the time. Yep. So in a BYO program, if that happens, they lose a the device or let's even say it's stolen. Yep. Do they pay for the device? Yep. Do you spot? So they're completely responsible for replacing that device. So That's right. If, if it's a six hundred dollar thing, um, do you encourage them to get insurance? Do you build that in with any of the carriers and stuff? Or? Yeah. So we uh, we it's a and it's an internal marketplace essentially. So if you want to get it, you can, and we give you some options. Just like device buyback, we give you a bunch of options. You can pick whoever you want. You know, it's it's up to you because you own the device. Uh, my personal recommendation is put seven hundred dollars in the bank. And earn interest on it and hope you never have to use it. And most of the time we don't, right? 10 a month out of 67,000 is a rounding error. Um, so most of the time it's not an issue, uh, but that's what we recommend that people do. Uh, but they're, to your point, they're remarkably careful with the devices. I think both because they own them, but also because it's, up, it's ultimately up to them as to how quickly they want to upgrade. So prior to this, when we were doing 100% corporate, when we announced a new device, we'd see a huge spike in lost and stolen. Lost, stolen, dropped in a toilet, lost, run, like, o- run over. Forward and backwards, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. We, we, yeah, we had that discussion today. You know, Somebody ran over a device twice with a forklift and you know, wasn't broken the first time. Yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's what went away immediately. Because what we said was you can have as many devices as, you, as your wallet will allow which tends to be two, maybe three sometimes. Some people have way more, but generally it's in that range. And um, and people are very careful with them because they know they're getting, most of them realize they're getting the first one at a discount and then the second one comes with a much higher price tag uh, if they need to do it. But then we have people that flip devices. So they'll buy one on a contract and they'll they'll flip it and they'll buy the next one the next day and then they'll flip it. And like monthly, we have people who are going through this. Uh, as you can imagine, right? We have some very innovative people who like to. I have a very good friend at work who flips devices probably every four months. Yeah, and he pays for them all himself. But you know, he'll walk in with a new device, and so we, you know, it's yeah, you know, it's interesting. Which kind of leads to the next thing. You started out in probably two thousand eight, two thousand nine as an iOS shop because that's you know what you enabled. I don't think Android right. is there for you. Not until. Uh, so the Motorola Droid didn't have a pin. Uh, so the only way for the Motorola Droid to work was for our users to buy Nitro Desk Touchdown, which we encouraged but didn't pay for. And all, the, and all they got was email on the device. Email, calendar, contacts. Yeah, we wrote uh, the WebEx Android client, I think, came out at some point that year. I don't remember exactly when. Um, so then, then we added that. They could always put it on the corporate network. That was always allowed. Um, but yeah, but that's we couldn't we couldn't put email on it because we couldn't put a pin. The HTC whatever it was that came out that summer, it had a pin on it, so it was the first Android device that passed all of our enablement tests uh, because it finally did. And, and did to be pin. clear, what you you do something you know I call it manage BYOD, but you kind of said it's got to meet these minimum set of requirements, and as long as it meets these minimum set of requirements, you're welcome to get it. And you kind of said if it doesn't do this. We're not going to allow you on. That's right. Well, and the system doesn't allow you on, right? ActiveSync won't set up a connection unless it enforces the things we tell it to. Um, and with our identity services engine product, it's the same thing for the corporate network now. Uh, and, and the way I look at it is kind of like like if you've ever been to a state fair or Six Flags or something, there's that, that guy that says you need to be this tall to ride the ride. But well, you can't see is he's holding his hand up in the middle of the room. Going, uh, yeah, sorry. This guy's got to be this tall. We should be on TV. This would work better. Uh, but we actually have two levels, right? So we have one that says if your device does, for example, if it does pan, lock, and wipe, if we can enable it via ActiveSync, then that's what you get access to. Get and then email only. And email, then email, calendar, email, calendar contacts. I call it, I say email only. PIM. Yeah. PIM uh, WebEx and Jabber, all the cloud services. 
if we can fully trust your device, we came up with this policy called the trusted device position and, um, and, and it has nine criteria by operating system, what you need in order to be trusted. Um, and if your device meets all of them, then you get access to everything. You get cert-based VPN, you get full wireless access, you get the entire app suite because we don't care who owns the device. What we care about is its po the posture of the device. And, and whether or not with that, po you know, I call it the controls. If it has the right basic controls, which allow you to protect your data. That's right. You can ha you can put it on the device. You can put it on the network and you can do all this stuff. If it doesn't, and you know, I wrote a blog about this. I know you commented about it. You know, I call it manage BYOD and, yep. and you know, say, you know, it's kind of a pyramid. We're going to give you a list that if it meets these criteria, you get full ecosystem access. And that's true BYOD. Yep, true right. BYOD means you can come in, you can be on the network, you can look at data, you can whatever you want to do, you can do. Then there is what we call limited BYOD, which is email only. Mm -hmm. and, um, email calendar contacts, but right. basically yeah. PIM functionality yep. and stuff that is non-confidential. Right. So for you, it's Jabra, and WebEx. Services, yeah. you know, and, but that's it. Yep. And right. then, there, then there's the third one, which is it's none of these. And you get nothing. And you're out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we don't care that you paid for it. You want to actually participate. You actually have to go and buy a required device. Yeah, and we actually we had that recently um, with a specific tablet from a specific vendor uh, who doesn't do full remote wipe. So we brought the device in. We brought it through the enablement process. Full well thinking this is going to work fine because they're the ones that do this. And uh, we pressed the wipe button and it only wiped email, calendar, and contacts. It didn't wipe the attachment that we dragged out into the file system from the email app. And they got no access, I'm going to guess. And they got no access. We blocked the devices from ActiveSync and we blocked them from the network. Because if I can't, if I can't control the data in some form or fashion, I'm not giving you any access to anything. It, it, it's the slide we saw today. There's the circle of trust. Yes. And then there's you outside the circle of trust. Yeah, and that, and that in, in this particular case, and the original Motorola Droid minus touchdown was in the same position, right? We couldn't put a pin on it. No soup for you, right? That's the way it works. Um, but touchdown could enable it so then people could get it. And that, again, this was 2010. But even today, we're still having a problem. So that's why we go through this. Um, uh, we kind of spot test this, the devices. Android is the biggest mix of things we need to test, but um, but that's why we go through this process still is because we're still running. Every once in a while, we run into something that breaks the. the I, I, I'm going to guess, you know, 2000, actually 2012. I'm going to guess you ran into the device, the original Kindle Fire. You, that you, was one. The, you know, you couldn't wipe it. Yeah, the newer one. You know, they put they actually put some controls in there. But the Kindle Fire was interesting because Nitro Dust Touchdown released an app for it within the first couple of weeks of being available. So for the people who wanted that, that app worked fine. We were totally happy with it. But that um, was all they got. But that was it, right? Yeah, that was they it. Probably, you didn't even give them cloud services, I'm going to guess, because it, all mean, it did, you know, there was nothing to protect. If there was that. an app for it, I guess. But, I mean, yeah, you, know, you didn't see a lot of people writing against that platform that was it was a colorful book reader so primarily. it's 2000 it's you know we're in september of 2013 so the end of the third quarter is coming up and you guys yeah you know, what are your numbers if i recall correctly there's some, you're more than 50 percent iphone android's growing um you have this tiny little bit of uh windows phone and blackberry's declining does that sound about right yep so, you know, because you allow anything, what's the percentage breakdown between iOS versus Android? So, uh, iOS is about half the fleet. Um, Android is about 20% of the fleet, roughly. Um, BlackBerry is smaller, and then there's the rest of it. Um, and Now, here's a question for you. I'm, gonna, I'm assuming that's mostly phones. What's the breakdown when you start looking at tablets? Uh, well, so that's the, that's the global breakdown. So, the... the if you break iOS up, there we have we're three to one iPhone to iPad, uh, and so there's about as many iPads as there are Android devices in total. And if you break the Android device count down, it's about ninety percent phones and about ten percent tablets. There aren't that many Android tablets. Definitely some, but there, uh, it's not a huge number. Surprisingly, uh, because because we have such a big Android phone fleet, I assumed we would see people doubling up, but but we actually see more people have an Android smartphone and an iPad that do have an Android smartphone and an Android tablet. And that, and that doesn't surprise me because, you know, 
like like me, you actually get to test all the devices I when do. you want to. You know, so you and I are in some rarefied air that we have lots of devices in our office. And yeah, we pass them out to people because I'm sure you do too. Well, and the carriers are nice enough to loan them to me as well, so, yeah. so our team can put the. Put yeah, them we, their we get those thirty or sixty day loans, but yeah. you know, it's for a long time. You know, getting apps to work well on an Android device was a struggle. Yes, and even today, there are phone apps that work on your Android device, but it's not a first world experience. And yeah, that may not be the best way to put it, but it's, it's not an equivalent experience to iOS. Um, and, and that speaks to the ongoing struggle around fragmentation of the platform um, and the fact that Google still hasn't figured out how to do upgrades fast enough. I mean, if you look at you look at iOS, it comes out. iOS 7 comes out tomorrow. don't know when this is going to be posted, but iOS 7 comes out tomorrow. Yeah, so so everybody knows it's Tuesday. It is the, I think it's the 17th because iOS is 7's the it's 18th. It's Christmas Eve for iOS 7. Yeah, I, that was actually, uh, I think that's what I titled a blog post a couple of weeks ago. You know, uh, the gifting season. The gifting season, yeah, it is. Um, so, uh, so tomorrow when, when Apple releases iOS 7, they will support a device that was released in 2011. Yes. So, it, you know, and it's one of those things of, and it's with the Mac too. And Absolutely. I, you know, I've had plenty of um, Windows PCs and plenty of Windows laptops. I don't have any that have lasted three years. No. You know, three years is the outside. I actually... Yeah, it's actually my wife's now, but a Mac I bought a Mac laptop that I bought in two thousand nine. She actually end of two thousand eight because it was around. You know, it was Christmas, Hanukkah, two thousand eight holiday season. She's still using today. The only thing I did at one point I replaced the uh, hard drive for an SSD, yeah. which made everybody happy because yeah. it worked much faster. But um, you know, we see the same thing with iOS, and we have the same experience that you do. That you know, we have people with iOS four, de- you know, iPhone four devices. That sure they may not get Siri, they may not get a few other things, but they're on iOS six and right now they're working and they're working well. That's right. Yeah. And you know the thing, and I don't know if you saw the article today. Apple actually quietly released the fact um, they didn't publicize it, but the fact that if you have a device that can't be upgraded to iOS seven, you can actually get an older version of yes. the app that is compatible. Finally. And, you know, that's huge because even Android doesn't really do that. Android kind of just keeps everything in the store and it works to a certain extent. But here, we're, you're going to be able to support even older devices. You know, so you'll be able to support – somebody has an iPod Touch that's three and a half years old, four, year, four, month, you know, four years old. You can support it if it has the encryption and the clients and everything else on it. Yeah, that, that's right. Although um, we, as part of our trusted device policy – we do have a, a call out around or a requirement around a minimum operating system. Uh, and right now for iOS, it's 614, 613, whichever one fixed the exchange bug because it fixed the exchange bug. So my guess, my guess is you're going to keep 614, but 70 is going, 7X is going to be your main operating system. Uh, yeah, after the first couple of weeks. Um, but what I what I think we'll see is once once we get a really good handle on all of the underhood changes on iOS seven, what we'll probably do is set iOS seven dot something dot something, not seven dot o dot o, but seven dot something dot something as the minimum, and we'll tell everybody that if your device is older than this, off you go. Yeah, and you know, for people that listen to the podcast, you know, experience will tell you from both Brett and myself. There will be a dot release within the first month or two. Probably. Because there's never been – I can't remember an Apple release that there weren't some bugs in the dot .0 release. So 6.0, 5.0. So there will probably be a, either 7.01 or 7.1 um, within, I'd say, a month or two. So that, you know, that's the big thing. Curious because I'll, I'll say how we're doing. You know, We've pretty much told everybody to you know, don't upgrade for the first two weeks. And they're Coke devices, so most of our stuff. But, you know, we've told our developers to get a hold of and test all their apps and all. But, you know, we've tried to warn people, hey, be a little bit careful. Some of your main apps may not work. We're going to let you upgrade, but we want to just make sure we have that initial compatibility. And it's communication, communication, communication. What do you guys do at Cisco? Yes. So, yes, exactly what you said. Um, Plus, we have over 1,000 people on the beta. And that's a combination of the 
of people in IT, right, who are responsible, like on, on our team and on a few others who are responsible for uh, making sure that the whole solution works, but also the folks who develop apps like WebEx and Jabber and several others uh, who need to make sure that these apps are working for everybody on launch day. Uh, so, for example, we'll, we already have a uh, WebEx app that's in the store that's iOS 7 compatible, um, and you'll see the same thing. So we have lots of people that do testing, and this is the biggest under the hood and over the hood, this is the biggest change to iOS ever. And so we've taken all of the three months and are still needing a little bit more time internally to make sure that all of those apps behave and look and feel the way that they need to uh, inside of iOS 7. So we've done the same thing. We told the company, wait a couple of weeks, we'll keep you updated, go visit our social site to find out what the current status of all the applications are. We've listed out every application, we read yellow green, we put a date against it about when, we, when it's gonna be upgraded properly. Um, and so, so our users can make a choice. We're not going to block them, even if we could, but we're not going to block them from upgrading. They need to make a decision. If they make the decision, they're acknowledging that they're going to deal with whatever the status of it is at the point at which they upgrade. And my expectation is that we'll probably see in the first week about 10,000 devices get upgraded. We have 68,000 in total. Um, so I think we'll see, sorry, 50,000 iOS devices. So I think we'll see about 20% upgrade in the first week, full well knowing what's going to happen. Um, and then everybody else, once we tell them, they'll start to trickle up from there. So talking about that, um, let's switch gears just a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to keep you too long. So we actually have somewhere to be in a little bit. Um, but let's talk a little bit about application development sure. and how, you know, I know you guys build a bunch of internal applications. We have. And, you know, how you handle that. And, you know, we like to talk, you know, talk about best practices for that and how you actually keep, you know, that stuff in line. Sure. So the um, so from a specific app dev part first, then we'll talk about app life cycle. So from from the application development uh, approach, we we always start with the business requirement. So in order to build a mobile app at Cisco, the first thing you need to do is define what problem it solves and who it solves it for. Right. So you need to identify who your target audience is. Let's say our target audience are sale field sales account managers. And the problem we want to solve is that they need to submit expense reports. So we want to make it really easy for them to submit expense reports. So that's the problem statement. The second thing we do is we go talk to the people and we say, okay, you're an, you're an account manager in Kansas. Tell me what you want your phone to do to solve this problem. Now, when you say you go talk to the people, it's not you and IT. It's your developers go talk to them or who, who's actually handling that? So we in within... Our organization, we have a small but growing user experience team, um, and we have a couple of folks that do usability studies and do research. And research is the very first step in um, in doing user experience right. And so this is a component of research. So we, we've built personas around all the major, the 10 biggest roles in Cisco, account manager being one of them. Um, and so we take that persona and say, this is what we know about these people. We then go talk to the folks and say, this is what we're thinking about, or this is something that you've asked us to do. Um, and so our user experience team will go out and talk to them. And then once we understand, once we kind of calibrate the requirements, then we'll come back and we'll take a look at the security requirements around it. Um, and we'll also look at some of the usability requirements. So for example, with the expense app, we wanted to make sure that it worked offline. So if you went on a trip and you got on a plane, on the way home, you could fire up your device in airplane mode and you could submit your, or at least prepare your expense report so when you hit the network, when you got back, or maybe you jumped on GoGo on the way back or whatever, you could submit that expense report once it's done. The other thing was we need the camera in this case, right? Because I'm going to take pictures of receipts. And I wanted Geo to work because I want to geotag the restaurant where I had the expense report. So, and I needed contacts integration because I wanted to be able to tag all the people that were, uh, that were at dinner, for example. So... So we had to look at all of those. So there's a combination of usability, right? What are the data sources I need and what things do I need to make the app work? And then also on the security side, we had to make sure this was encrypted. This is financial data, right? So we had to make sure it was encrypted. We actually made sure it was encrypted on the fly going back into the ERP. And we had to make sure um, that, that like my kid couldn't log in and screw it up somehow. Um, so we look at all of that. And then we make a build versus buy decision. In this case, we built because the vendor that we use for expense management in general doesn't have a mobile app for this, so we had to build it. Um, so we built one, um, and then we went back and user tested. We did more user testing around it to make sure that it worked and it was easy to use. 
Um, and then we built a support plan for it, built a comms plan for it, rolled it out, and watched adoption happen from there. And so that's how you do that part. And then how do you build the best practices in and stuff? You know, the security and all. You know, so you have usability, you have your developers, but there's that other piece of having those conversations and that type of thing. Yeah, so we have a, an app governance model, right? So we have a, an app store within the company um, that now runs on top of our own uh, enterprise service catalog. And we built a governance process around it. So we said, in order for you to be in the store, the store is the only way you can deploy apps officially. Uh, so in order to get in the store, you have to go through our governance process. One step is to make sure you have support. One step is to make sure you do usability testing. One step is to make sure that you go through our security stuff. So our InfoSec and information security guys are doing security reviews. We have a small user experience team who are doing usability tests. So we want to make sure, because the goal in the store is that it's curated, meaning it's safe to go here. You know that every app in the store is going to make your life better in some way. Because that's the goal of this, right? Make you more productive, make business go faster, allow you to collaborate easily. We need to be able to do those things. And that's what a curated store is all about. Awesome. Okay, so we're running out of time here. So three nuggets of wisdom. What what have you learned? You can't communicate enough. 100% agree. You can't communicate enough. That is the most important thing. Go out and talk to your own user base. Do not assume, if you're in IT, that you know what a sales guy does. User experience, user experience, user experience. You know, we, you know, you and I have talked about this before, but I'm a big person about saying you have to take ride-alongs. You have to spend time with your users. Absolutely. See what they do. Um, two more nuggets. Yeah, so uh, the second one is around security. Um, so security and user experience are not opposites. You can improve security and user experience at the same time. It's difficult, but it's possible. And you need to be able to figure out how to do it. You can't always do it. Sometimes it's a trade-off. But a lot of times, if you work on the problem long enough or hard enough, you can figure out a way to do both. And I, I'll tell you what I found, because I have to agree with you. Um, if security is involved from the beginning versus coming in at the end... Yes. Improving usability and security is much easier than when you bring it at the end. It is absolutely a trade-off. It's almost impossible to bring it in at the end and not hurt usability because security looks in and says, wait, you didn't do this, this, and this, and all of a sudden you're cutting off functionality. Yep. So last one. Uh, Self-support and automation are how you scale the solution. Um, so automation makes life easier because it takes steps out of processes. And self-support is generally is a win-win if you design it the right way. You have to make it user-friendly because if it's not, nobody will use it. But if you make it user-friendly, then you'll be able, as we have, to triple devices in four years and bottom out our caseload in the same time. So we have fewer support cases than we've ever had. And we have triple the number of devices that we had three years ago. Awesome. Brett, this has been terrific. Thank you for coming on. People can follow you on Twitter at bbuilding. Um, and certainly you write a couple of blogs on the Cisco blog site. Um, but we'll include, B, we'll include your Twitter handle in the uh, show notes so you'll be able to see that. And I thank you for coming on. Thanks for spending the time because this, this has been a lot of fun. This is the type of stuff I love. So Absolutely. Thank you very much. And for all our listeners out there, um, thanks for another great episode. Hope you enjoyed listening. You have suggestions, people you want to hear, people um, you want me to talk to. Um, send me an email, any suggestions. Drop a line on Twitter. Leave a note on the web page. And, yes, for those of listeners that have asked, we, are, we do listen to you. We will be coming up with our own iTunes feed. So it's not just going to be, you know, we're going to stay associated with the Cloudcast, but we will have our own mobile cast feed on iTunes, hopefully within the next week, maybe by the time this is out there. And signing off from uh, beautiful San Diego, and we'll talk to you next episode.